If we don't have free speech, then we just don't have a free country. It's as simple as that. If this most fundamental right is allowed to perish, then the rest of our rights and liberties will topple just like dominoes one by one. They'll go down. That's why today I'm announcing my plan to shatter the left-wing censorship regime and to reclaim the right to free speech for all Americans. And reclaim is a very important word in this case because they've taken it away. In recent weeks, bombshell reports have confirmed that a sinister group of deep state bureaucrats, Silicon Valley tyrants, left-wing activists, and depraved corporate news media have been conspiring to manipulate and silence the American people. They have collaborated to suppress vital information on everything from elections to public health. The censorship cartel must be dismantled and destroyed, and it must happen immediately. And here is my plan. First, within hours of my inauguration, I will sign an executive order banning any federal department or agency from colluding with any organization, business, or person to censor, limit, categorize, or impede the lawful speech of American citizens. I will then ban federal money from being used to label domestic speech as mis- or disinformation. And I will begin the process of identifying and firing every federal bureaucrat who has engaged in domestic censorship, directly or indirectly, whether they are the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Health, Human Services, the FBI, the DOJ, no matter who they are. Second, I will order the Department of Justice to investigate all parties involved in the new online censorship regime, which is absolutely destructive and terrible, and to aggressively prosecute any and all crimes identified. These include possible violations of federal civil rights law, campaign finance laws, federal election law, securities law, and antitrust laws, the Hatch Act, and a host of other potential criminal, civil, regulatory, and constitutional offenses. To assist in these efforts, I am urging House Republicans to immediately send preservation letters, and we have to do this right now, to the Biden administration, the Biden campaign, and every Silicon Valley tech giant, ordering them not to destroy evidence of censorship. Third, upon my inauguration as president, I will ask Congress to send a bill to my desk revising Section 230 to get big online platforms out of censorship business. From now on, digital platforms should only qualify for immunity protection under Section 230 if they meet high standards of neutrality, transparency, fairness, and non-discrimination. We should require these platforms to increase their efforts to take down unlawful content such as child exploitation and promoting terrorism while dramatically curtailing their power to arbitrarily restrict lawful speech. Fourth, we need to break up the entire toxic censorship industry that has arisen under the false guise of tackling so-called myths and disinformation. The federal government should immediately stop funding all nonprofits and academic programs that support this authoritarian project. If any U.S. university is discovered to have engaged in censorship activities or election interferences in the past, such as flagging social media content for removal of blacklisting, those universities should lose federal research dollars and federal student loan support for a period of five years and maybe more. We should also enact new laws laying out clear criminal penalties for federal bureaucrats who partner with private entities to do an end run around the Constitution and deprive Americans of their first, fourth, and fifth amendment rights. In other words, deprive them of their vote. And once you lose those elections, and once you lose your borders like we have, you no longer have a country. Furthermore, to confront the problems of major platforms being infiltrated by legions of former deep staters and intelligence officials, there should be a seven-year calling-off period before any employee of the FBI, CIA, 
NSA, DNI, DHS, or DOD is allowed to take a job at a company possessing vast quantities of U.S. user data. Fifth, the time has finally come for Congress to pass a digital bill of rights. This should include a right to digital due process. In other words, government officials should need a court order to take down online content, not send information requests such as the FBI was sending to Twitter. Furthermore, when users of big online platforms have their content or accounts removed, throttled, shadow banned, or otherwise restricted, no matter what name they use, they should have the right to be informed that it's happening, the right to a specific explanation of the reason why, and the right to a timely appeal. In addition, all users over the age of 18 should have the right to opt out of content moderation and curation entirely and receive an unmanipulated stream of information if they so choose. The fight for free speech is a matter of victory or death for America and for the survival of Western civilization itself. When I am president, this whole rotten system of censorship and information control will be ripped out of the system at large. There won't be anything left. By restoring free speech, we'll begin to reclaim our democracy and save our nation. Thank you, and God bless America. You know, I'm out for another hike, but look at the damage from the hurricane. Just snapped that big tree right off like right there. And then you look right over here, took all that down too. We weren't even at the brunt of the hurricane. Can you imagine what it was like down south or south of here? I'm in central Florida, you know. Damn. I'd like to keep just giving you a view of what I see when I hike. This is uh, the Florida Trail at the, uh, if you're ever in central Florida, at the Vortex. Quite beautiful hike here. Oh, man, look at that. Raccoon going up a tree. Two of them. Holy moly. Well. Oh. Let me shut the hell up here. Let's see if we can get them. Uh, see him over there? Hold on, hold on. Boy, he wouldn't want one of them. There he is up there. See him? Up high? Uh, he's looking at me. He's looking at me. Let's see if we can get the other one. Man. Right up there. See him? He's moving around. Boy, I cut the camera on at just the right time, didn't I? Anyway, I was gonna say, you know, I wonder, you know, all the, back in 2000, when the cough was here, like I said, I, my wife, I damn it, walked right into a spider web. Oh God, I hate that. Get my head and make sure there are no spiders on me. Uh, anyway, you know, back then, everybody I knew, I didn't realize they were all Democrats. They all disowned me and they wanted nothing to do with me. You know, and I wonder, wonder how they're feeling today. <laughs> I wonder if a single one of them said, you know, that, uh, that cybersecurity guy was right about everything. I wonder, you know. I mean, I, I'm happy I heard that uh, Trump's going to take on the transgender problem, saying that kids will not be allowed to get trans or, uh, uh, gender surgery uh, without parental approval. I don't know why a Democrat would be for their kid taking hormone pills and, but, well, it, at any time, but I, I don't understand why they would not want the, the school or whoever, a doctor, to at least talk to them first before cutting off their genitals. <laughs> but that's who the Democrats are. They don't make any sense to me. That's why I, I can't, it's hard for me to be around a Democrat. Somebody, you know, please, in, in the video, leave a comment and say, you know, that cybersecurity guy, you know, maybe, uh, Maybe to be around a Democrat, this is what you need to do. But I mean, I just like, I think they're from an alien planet or something like that. But anyways, 
hope you're enjoying the view. I didn't want to put my ugly mug on, on the video this time. But anyway, I just wanted to talk about things. I'm glad we got that raccoon. That was fun. Just to go back to Susie for a second, the fact that he got to this first and the fact that she is going to have, you know, influence over how the rest of this transition unfolds, whether it's picking attorney general or, or any of these uh, other high level positions. I think, I think we ought to all look at this as a wise decision, a good decision. And for everybody out there wanting Trump to pivot or change or somehow whatever you want him to do, he just, he just won a mandate from the American people to execute on the program that he laid out in this election. It wasn't particularly close. And I think he ought to put people in place who are going to do it. That's what the he people are asking for. his enemies? I mean, that's... That's, that's not that's, what he ran that's, on. That's, yes, he yes, yes, he did. did. <laughs> it is explicitly what he ran on. That's explicitly... That's not what he ran on. Look at what he okay. said in the past that's week. Fine. He literally said that he was going to, to, to exact you, you, vengeance. You still don't understand how you lost. He ran on don't immigration. Don't say me. I'm not a Democrat. He ran on immigration. Yep. He ran on immigration. He ran on, he ran on inflation. I'm not here paying for this. This is one of the many things he ran, he ran on in addition he ran, to He ran on the, the issues that people care about. He ran on Stop. the economy. He I, ran nobody's on Nobody's saying that he didn't run on those things, but he also ran on vengeance. Yes. He did also run on going after the, the people who went after him. But he's and journalists. was a key feature of he all of his Yes, Scott, Scott he said, literally said, I am your retribution. The Biden crime family, lock her up went after Sessions repeatedly for not doing what he wanted Sessions to do, which was to indict Hillary or whoever he wanted you, to indict. You can want his campaign to have been about, you know, tax reform and things like that. That is not what he said on the stump time after time after and time. Also the, he talked about January, going after his I, enemy. I, I, I'm, I'm heartened even by the fact just, that, the, that the left still cannot even figure this out. Even if you just out. take the January 6th <laughs> part of it, he, he made that a big part of his campaign, that he would, if he were in power, pardon those people. You can't say that that was not on the agenda. It absolutely was. What was the campaign about? Why did tens okay, of millions of people... Okay, but do you think that he's going to do those other things when it comes to the Department of Justice? I, I, I don't know what he's going to do. I'm not talking to him. A big part of him. the campaign I, was, just, was being a victim. Like, that was a big part of it, was his victimhood. They're coming for you, but they're going to have to get through me. That was his whole line. That is all about the enemies list. That no, is all, I, yes, totally is. I totally disagree. The deep state. That, that's I mean, not, this, is, this is the stuff that he talked about on the stump. Unless you just don't want to listen to him. Those no, are his I, own I, I, I listen, I listen Scott, plenty. Do you, Scott, do you, if you believe that people who violated the Capitol on January 6th committed a crime, which I would hope you would because they weren't invited in the way they claimed they were, right? They, they were not there. They didn't go through security the way the rest of us have to go through to get into the Capitol. They were prosecuted. They were convicted. And now they're serving jail time. And he has said repeatedly that they're political prisoners and he is going to spring them, Right. What does that tell you about how he's going to weaponize the Justice Department and on whose behalf? On behalf of people who committed crimes for him. For him, not for anybody else. I mean, I, I admire your, I don't know if I want to call it naivete or optimism that Trump is going to run on the policies you care about, about deregulation and tax cuts and whatnot. That's just not what his campaign was about. Well, That's I, not I, what think, he has I think it's not, with, with all due you? respect, I've, I've, I've run more campaigns than you, and I know what campaigns are about, and I know why people walk into voting booths. Why people totally walk wrong. into why people walk into voting this. booths and what Trump plans to do when handed the presidency are two different things. Wow! Look at this. Took that down. You know, isn't it funny how the Democrats? You know, they always. Talked about how Kamala's a female. You got to vote for a female. And then Trump just named it the female chief of staff, the first one in American history, I believe. And they're completely silent about it. <laughs> I just, I can't believe how biased they are. I mean, it's just, it's so in your face. I mean, I don't, even a Democrat's got to be able to see that, you know, they're being lied to about everything that the mainstream media covers. I, I mean, if you know a Democrat, ask them, say, do you believe what the mainstream media reports? I mean, why why wouldn't they be celebrating the fact that Trump just had a woman for his chief of staff? I don't get it. One of these days, still too buggy right now, especially a lot of spiders today. <laughs> but uh, the dog is back with the, the ex-Democrat uh, there, poor little guy. But I'm going to sit right there and read a book one day. 
It's, uh, it's kind of wild because it's out here in the middle of nowhere. I wanted you to see this. What the hell? I wonder if that's an edible mushroom. <laughs> Maybe uh, somebody tell me. I mean, what kind of mushroom would that be? It's pretty wild looking though, isn't it? Oh. Anyway, I just uh, wanted to get that on the video. I noticed another thing. A lot of horse poop on this trail. And the horses are not supposed to be on this trail. But there's a lot of, a lot of trees like this across the trail. So they would have to dismount that horse quite a bit trying to, I mean, because it wasn't made for horseback riding, you know. There goes the squirrel. Good. We got him on the video. Uh, I to tell you, cutting the camera on at the right moments, huh? Boy, I had to get this on the video. Look at that tree. Is that one wild looking tree? That's crazy, isn't it? Man. Yeah, I got to thinking maybe all those illegal immigrants backfired. On the Democrats. Now, that maybe not in four years, you know, the law. But the thing is, I'm not so sure they all will be voting Democrat. Because, you know, when Trump gets in there, I would imagine he's going to cut off all that uh, uh, American taxpayer money that was going to house and feed all the illegal immigrants. That means they're going to be on their own working, well, taking jobs away from, from poor people in the United States, unfortunately. That's the only way they're going to be able to make ends meet. I mean, I think if all of them have been getting that free ride. They might not, they might not appreciate. Well, I mean, obviously they're, they're going to be pissed at Trump and the Republicans for cutting off their aid, but I think they might have to reflect back, you know, uh, and say, well, what's, what's the root cause? Say, well, it was the Democrats bringing us all in, you know, 30 million of us and uh, promising us everything. And then, uh, and then, you know, and that was a lie. Because there's no way, even the Democrats could not have continued to fund the illegal immigrants at the, at the pace that they were. I mean, they took all the FEMA money, for example, and gave it to the illegal immigrants. And that pissed off a lot of Americans, especially in North Carolina. So I'm just making some observations. There's another big tree. We've got to some really old trees here in Florida. It's kind of amazing. But anyway, just wanted to make those observations. What do you think? You think that uh, the illegal immigrants are going to backfire on the Democrats in four years? Leave a leave a comment, because uh, they're not going to get citizenship uh, unless they go go out of the country and come in the correct way. So, and of course, the only place they can vote is in California, Washington, and Oregon, where they have no voter ID. Uh, the rest of the states. Well, you could say some of the, the swing states, uh, they don't do a very good job. Obviously, Arizona's still counting their ballots, and you know what that means. That's, a, that's Maricopa County cheating, cheating as usual. Boy, there's another wild-looking tree. All right. Unity was actually possible, and I don't want to squander it. One of my messages to our fellow Republicans afterwards is many of us, myself included, have spent a good portion of the last probably a year and a half since I ran for president, but especially this year, when necessary, dunking on our competition. We have to do that when a competition to win an election. But at this point, I think we have to quickly adjust to the new mode that we're in. We're, all, we're on the eve, I believe, of a new golden age in the United States of America. I truly believe that. I think that talking about the radical Biden agenda or the Harris failures there's a certain momentum that makes you likely to do that. You're in a muscle memory and in a practice of continuing to state what you did about the opposition. I guess I would call on our fellow Republicans to say we're done with that. Not because we want to play nice or sweep it under the rug, but because we have more important work to do. We have the work ahead of starting the golden era ahead for our United States of America, the new United States and the new Republican Party that I think is going to create it. And equally, my message and my ask of Democrats on the other side, of everybody who may not have voted for Donald Trump or for Bernie Moreno, or who may not have ever voted Republican for that matter, is to give us a chance, actually. I think all of us want a more united nation of a kind we haven't, we haven't really had in this country in a generation. And I think the fact that this election was decided not by a small margin, but by such a decisive margin so quickly, we were expecting to be here, by the way, not knowing necessarily who even was going to be the president of the United States. Keep in mind, that was the expectation as of Monday. As of 3 a.m., we were in the Palm Beach Convention Center 
to chance of USA decisively knowing who the U.S. president was. That itself is an accomplishment. You looked across the board. You look at the counties across the country. It's the states that we talk about in the Electoral College map. Yes, Trump will have gotten well over 300 Electoral College votes, probably by a significant margin. But even if you look at places like New York, counties in California, counties in blue states, we saw a shift and a new kind of coalition that makes possible what was unimaginable just 20 years ago. And so I think if those on our side are willing to say we're willing to put the grievances of yesterday behind because we won and we won decisively and we're going to marshal that to not just run from something, but run to something, enter that golden age with the vision of what's possible in the United States of America. I can equally ask of our friends on the left to say, give us a chance to prove what's possible. This isn't the Republican Party of yesterday. America first includes all Americans as it should. And I think that Donald Trump is going to hopefully use the learnings of that first time. I believe he is. We spent a lot of election night together. I'm confident that he is eager to harness the learnings of that first term to go even further in this second term than anybody imagined, even in uniting the nation. Maybe not through words, through cheap verbiage. That doesn't really unite people, but action does. Success is unifying. And I think our goal as a movement is that even in the MAGA movement, we don't want to be saying make America great again in four years because we won't have to. We'll just be saying make America greater. That's what America's always been, greater than we've always been, the pursuit of excellence. We don't have to make America great again. If we make a few small fixes four years from now, we'll just be talking about making America greater. As I like to joke around, MAGA will become MAG, and that's the permanent movement ahead for the country over the next 250 years. One of the things that's going to happen two years into Trump's first term, second term now, people forget about this, but it's an important one to me. It's a small point in the scheme of things, but I think it's a big one in symbolizing where we are as a country, is we're going to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. America's 250th anniversary is coming up in 2026. That's a birthday worth celebrating, I believe. And I think, yes, and it's coming up. And I think that's really what this victory was about. It wasn't about any one of the individual issues. The issues are important, and I'll get to them in a moment. You know, the border, the economy, we can go straight down the list. But I think the heart of this election was really about restoring a kind of national pride, a kind of national character that we have long lacked. Those young men who I was playing tennis with just before coming here who voted, drove 12 hours to cast their ballot this time around in a way that they never had before, What's going on there is there is a hunger in this country to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Hunger to be an American, for that to mean something. And for the last decade or more, we have been lost, especially young people, but I think it goes for all of us, hungering for direction and purpose and meaning. A loss of national pride of a kind we haven't seen since the Great Depression, since over a century. Last time we had this crisis of national self-confidence was in 1860, at the time of the Civil War. Less than 16% of Gen Z has said they're proud to be an American. We have a 25% recruitment deficit in our U.S. military. It is that national character that's actually upstream of our economic struggles. Because how can you live the American dream if you're not willing to take risk to start a new business, if you don't have the self-confidence to do it? So I think that's really what this election was about, was about restoring a kind of American self-confidence that we've missed for a very long time, but we don't have to miss any longer. What's one of the things that the election results revealed is that the politics of yesterday, so many aspects of it are now history. You see the spending in swing states. This is one of the more interesting parts of the sausage making of politics that interested me. Democrats outspent Republicans in the swing states by over three to one. It didn't matter. I think the era of the scripted political advertisements, that's now slowly, if not gradually, being relegated to the dustbins of history. Instead, talking directly to voters. Mainstream media as a filter for the flow of information versus a free and open internet. We, it's clear who won on that score in this election. So we're in a changing time, a changing time for the betterment of our country. And I don't mean this as a partisan message. I think it's going to be good for Democrats and good for Republicans alike. I think the Democratic Party, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but one of the things I'm rooting for is the rise of a Democratic Party that goes through some introspection and asks itself whether that left-wing excess of cultural wokeism that I think has destroyed this party is really going to be the way of the future, in which case I think the Democratic Party also goes to the dustbins of history, 
Or, more likely, the Democratic Party evolves to become a better version of itself than the version that had captured the party that actually ran its candidate in this election. And I personally am actually rooting for that. Because I think that makes our country stronger. If we have a two-party system where each party is pushing the other to be the best version of itself, that too is, I think, going to be one of the unexpected side effects of what came out of this election. So what can we expect in the next four years tangibly? Well, we'll start with policy. President Trump, in that first term, one of the things he did is he went into the White House, he had a whiteboard, he said, promises made, promises kept. He went down and ticked the list, and I think this time around it's going to be no different. At the top of the list is addressing the immigration crisis in our country. And I say that holistically, starting first with illegal immigration. One of the things we're going to refuse to do is to conflate the issues of illegal migration with legal immigration to this country. But I think we have to go in order to be able to rebuild the kind of trust that's been missing with the American electorate. I think we're going to take a hard line on illegal immigration. And I say this, it's a very personal issue to me. I'm the kid of legal immigrants who came to this country the right way through the front door, part of a tradition that's existed since the very founding of our country for all 250 years of it. But I say this as the kid of legal immigrants. Your first act of entering this country cannot break the law. And that is why if we've had the largest influx of illegals into this country in American history. It stands to reason that we ought to have the largest mass deportation in American history. That's not xenophobic. That's not racist. That's what it means to stand for the rule of law in the United States of America. It means securing the border and applying the laws as they already exist. Can we have a debate about new legislation? Yes, we can. But the beauty is our current laws actually work quite effectively if we're willing to enforce them. Remain in Mexico is still the law of the land. Courts have held so despite the fact that Biden tried to overturn it. All we need to do is actually apply it. Complete the physical barriers, including the completion of the construction of the southern border wall. I've traveled down there, and some of this is actually quite cost-effective. Aquatic barriers in the Rio Grande. Ending the incentives for people to be here illegally. Ending the funding of sanctuary cities. This, I think, will bring the illegal immigration crisis down to its nadir as it was in 2019 when President Trump was last president. And I think that that's something that if we take off our partisan filters and the constraints that stop even our friends in the Democratic Party from being able to say what they actually think and take off the shackles, I think most Americans agree that if you're going to come to this country, do it the right way through the front door. And if you're coming in by breaking the law, that's not exactly what the United States of America represents. The, the sad aspect of our current immigration system is for all the debates that we could have about what kind of immigrants we want in the country, we could imagine that you want the smartest people coming to the United States, the hardest working people coming to the United States. Maybe the people who love the United States of America the most should be the ones who we prioritize. We could debate what should be the right criteria for designing an immigration system. Turns out our current immigration system rewards none of those human attributes. The number one human attribute right now, it's not debatable, it may be uncomfortable to hear, but it's not debatable. The number one human attribute that our current immigration system actually rewards is your willingness to lie to the U.S. government. If you say that you're not seeking asylum, because you can't in good conscience tell the U.S. government that you're seeking asylum when in fact you're not undergoing persecution, you're not going to get in. But if you're not actually undergoing persecution, but you're willing to tell the U.S. government that you are, you do get in. It's a system that rewards the very people who are willing to lie to the U.S. government versus those who aren't. And that's not something that makes sense regardless of what your politics are. And I think once we have then reformed that illegal immigration crisis and the border crisis that goes along with it, we will have rebuilt the trust to then ask the question of what kind of legal immigration system actually helps and advances the interests of the United States of America. We've all met countless legal would-be immigrants who would add value to the United States but who aren't able to get in through the current bureaucratic system as it gets in, but we have to reform the illegal crisis before we actually lay the foundation for fixing what that future of legal immigration looks like in the United States. So that's at the top of the list, and yes, the feature policy is the mass deportation of many illegals, but I think behind that are a lot of common-sense policies that Americans, regardless of their skin color and political affiliation, agree on. Now, that brings me to the second policy, which is bureaucratic reform, which I think is an essential part of this new administration and also what the future of the United States of America ought to look like. The fact of the matter is, today in America, we don't really have three branches of government 
as our founding fathers envisioned. The branch that exercises the most power is the fourth branch of government, that is unelected bureaucrats, who are effectively writing policy that never went through Congress. That's really a bastardization of what our founding fathers envisioned, and it is also the single greatest threat to economic growth in the United States. So thank you. I appreciate that. As I've, uh, as I've often said uh, half-jokingly, although it's only half-jokingly, yes, we support the deportation of millions of illegal immigrants from this country, but the mass deportation that will really save this country is the mass deportation of millions of unelected federal bureaucrats out of the D.C. bureaucracy and into the private sector, by the way. I'm told we have some open jobs. And that's exactly how we save a country. And, and the beauty of this is the last few years have given us the legal landscape to do it. I often get the question of, well, why didn't President Trump do this the first time around? I don't love the form of that question for a few reasons. First is it denies the possibility of improvement, right? The fact that even as our country, we've never been perfect as we're a nation comprised of human beings and not gods. But I would rather live in a country that has ideals and falls short of them than one that has no ideals at all. But a more pragmatic note on this question of why President Trump didn't do it in the first term, he didn't have the legal landscape to do what he can do and what we can do now. The Supreme Court has handed down what I think are some of the most important cases of our lifetime in the last two years. West Virginia versus EPA is a critical case that said that if it's a major policy question, call it the major questions doctrine in that case, if it's a major policy question, affects economic policy or affects your individual rights, it can't go through administrative rulemaking. It has to go through Congress. And if it did go through administrative rulemaking before, those rules currently are unconstitutional under current law. Pair that with the overturning of Chevron deference in the Loper Bright case this year, which says that federal courts no longer have to engage in deference to the judgments of administrative agencies. And we have the basis of a one-two punch for an administrative reform in the United States of America of a kind that has not been possible since the advent of the administrative state over 100 years ago under Woodrow Wilson's watch, which expanded under FDR, metastasized like a cancer under LBJ, and frankly some Republican presidents along the way, Nixon included, have some culpability in continuing to expand. It is a century-long sin in the United States of America that we now have a historic and generational opportunity to correct. And the beauty of this victory of Tuesday night is that it was a diverse coalition of independent thinkers, outsiders, my friend Elon Musk was an important part of it through the very end of this process, which is a beautiful thing to watch. And I know he's chomping at the bit to be able to play his important role in this level of bureaucratic reform. Frankly, so am I. And so is President Trump. And J.D. Vance, our, our, my friend and our fellow Ohioan, he's going to do a great job as a vice president, is also largely an outsider to politics, but for the couple of years he spent in the U.S. Senate. And I do think it's going to take a band of rebels, if I may use a 1776 analogy, to come together and take on this federal leviathan. This isn't going to be easy work. I actually think compared to the two issues I just laid out, taking on the illegal immigration, which is going to be hard enough, but we have a clear path to resolving that by enforcing the rules as they already exist. This is going to be the tougher challenge, but it is also going to be the achievement that has a more lasting effect on the revival of the United States of America over the next century. To make sure the people we elect to run the government are the ones who actually run the government, not unelected bureaucrats in the deep state. Make our founding fathers proud. And that leads to an economic stimulus that gets us to the doorstep of that American golden age. That's what allows us to allow American drillers to drill, American oil companies to drill, baby drill, frack, baby frack, burn coal, by the way, without apology. The United States of America is the cleanest place on the planet to actually utilize coal, which along with natural gas is the basis for our baseload power generation, without which there isn't the electricity or the power needed to power, forget a green economy, even the AI revolution that's ahead. Nuclear energy, I think, is an important part of this as well, but increasing the supply of energy, frankly, increasing the supply of everything is how we fight inflation, bring costs down, incentivize risk-taking, allow entrepreneurs to unleash their potential Roll back that regulatory state. This is going to happen automatically. So what I think about, you could talk about a lot of different priorities for the next few years. But fixing the mass illegal immigration crisis and restoring a sane legal immigration system, which we don't have today. One that best advances the interests of the United States of America. And to combine that with mass bureaucratic reform of the administrative state and the regulatory state to put it back in its place in a way that would make George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and John Jay proud. 
That is how we save the country. And the beautiful part about this is I don't think it takes a long time to get that done, actually. Most of what needs to get done can get done not in a matter of years, but in a matter of months. And we're not far away from it. January 20th, 2025 is not far away. And that's what I would encourage, especially the Republicans in the room who are like me, probably in a little bit of a celebratory mood right now. Let's all remember that Tuesday night was not the destination. That was the start line. The destination is getting to a place where we actually have a country with three branches of government rather than four. We actually have a country that allows the best and brightest who love the United States of America to get into this country and serve this country and grow the Ameri- and live the American dream that we all wish for our kids. The country where we will look our kids in the eye and mean it. When we tell them you get ahead in the United States of America with your own hard work and commitment and dedication without anybody telling you that you have to shut up, sit down and do as you're told and censor yourself along the way. That's the America we know. That is the American dream that I think we are within striking distance of reviving. And if we do, I think we fill that vacuum that I think continues to fester at our nation's heart, that vacuum of purpose and identity and meaning. This what drew me into the presidential race last year. And I think that after we've solved a couple of these policy solutions one by one, I think we go back to filling that void of our national character that we're missing. Young people in particular, I'm, I'm a millennial. I'm 39 now. I was 37 when I ran for U.S. president. I was the youngest person ever to run for U.S. president as a Republican. And I can I can tell you what's going on with our generation, and especially with Gen Z, which you saw come out in droves at a scale that nobody predicted in this election, in this particular case coming out for Republicans across the country. Here's what's going on is we are hungry for a cause, actually. We're all hungry for purpose and meaning and identity. At a time in our national history when the things that used to fill that void, faith in God, patriotism, hard work, family. These things have disappeared. And when you have a vacuum that runs that deep, that's when the poison fills the void. And it almost doesn't matter what the poison actually is sometimes. We've made the mistake. I say we, I include myself in this. We've made the mistake at times of obsessing over the individual poison too much. Wokeism, transgenderism, Climatism, COVIDism, depression, anxiety, fentanyl, suicide. These are symptoms of a deeper void of purpose and meaning in our country. And we're not just going to solve this by criticizing the failures of the other side. We have to offer an alternative vision of who we are and what we actually stand for. The individual, family, nation, and God beats race, gender, sexuality, and climate if we have the courage to actually stand for something. And so I think in this moment, on the back of victory, having reached not the destination but the start line, we're done running from something. We're running back to something, back to our vision of what it means to be an American in the year 2024. We're running back to the ideals of 1776. We're running back to a country that prioritizes merit where the best person gets the job regardless of their skin color. A country where you get ahead not on the color of your skin but on the content of your character and your contributions. A country that once again reinstates and respects the rule of law in the United States of America. You enter with the consent of our country and the best and brightest are the ones who get in, not the ones who break the law. A country where the people we elect to run the government are the ones who actually run the government, not unelected bureaucrats. A country where we can all have elections that we trust and believe in with conviction. A country where you get to speak your mind in the open as long as I get to in return. And hopefully even a country where we can disagree like hell as Americans and still get together at the dinner table at the end of it. That is the America I know. That is the America that we miss. And if you give them a chance, even if you're on the left, I'm confident that that is the America that Donald Trump and our fellow Ohio and good friend J.D. Vance, I think, are going to work hard to revive from the top and setting an example from this country for this country in a way that I believe will go far beyond that first term. I think it was a successful first term, but I think the second term will go far beyond And that that brings me to our own state right here in Ohio. I think Donald Trump is going to make America great again. And I think after that, we're going to continue to make America greater. 
I think with his presidency, we also have a historic opportunity to make Ohio greater, to make this state the best version of ourselves, the best version of who we can be as a state. I'm proud of this state. I was born and raised here. I grew up in Cincinnati. We lived in New York. It's where my first company was founded. But before having kids, we decided we wanted to raise them here in Ohio, not in New York City. My wife also grew up in, uh, in the state up north of us, but she works at Ohio State now, so don't, don't hold that against her. She's a, she's a true Buckeye fan now. But, uh, you know, the reason we came back is that you go a 50-mile radius. You draw that around right where we are right now. You can travel that circle. That is a cross-section of the country. You don't have to travel the whole country. You could travel a 50-mile radius of where we are right now, and it's like you've traveled the United States of America. We were the first state and the only state that Thomas Jefferson, my favorite president, admitted to the Union in 1803. We were a frontier state before there was a frontier, actually. That's actually the tradition of this state. When we talk about American exceptionalism, the story of the unafraid, the explorers, the pioneers, that's actually the story of Ohio. All the way through most of our life as a state, from 1803 all the way out to 1949, even when it wasn't that long ago, in 1949, where five of the ten most prosperous cities in the United States of America were right here in our state, actually. Toledo was the rubber capital of the world. Hey, Toledo was a glass capital. Akron was the rubber capital of the world. Cleveland and Youngstown were the steel capitals of the world. Cincinnati, where I grew up, was the consumer products capital. Dayton was the compute capital of the Industrial Revolution. This is the state that powered the last technology revolution, and I think we're about to go through the next one coming up. You think about even the positioning, the same advantages we had back then, access to waterways, 60% of North America's population within a one-day drive of where we are. That was true in 1949 as it is today. That's the environment that gave us the self-confidence for guys like Neil Armstrong, who actually grew up in 1949, only years later, to have the self-confidence to say he could go to outer space, achieve the impossible, what nobody envisioned from right here in the state of Ohio in the great tradition of the Wright brothers. That is the embodiment of American exceptionalism right here in Ohio. For being honest, it hasn't necessarily been that way in the 60 years or so since then, but it doesn't have to stay that way. I think the story of Ohio is the story of our country, a state that demonstrates what's actually possible, a state that can hopefully still attract the best and brightest. You have states like Florida and Texas that are doing a great job with leaders who have demonstrated what's possible with zero tax rates, with a business-friendly environment, but I see no reason why this state can't be the one that attracts the best entrepreneurs, becomes the best place to start and grow a new business, becomes the most attractive state to raise a new young family. I think this state has been that for much of our national history, and I think we can make it so again. It just requires a revival of that conviction in who we really are. So that's my ask of everybody here is, we have a moment here as a nation and as a state to revive our self-confidence, to achieve what our founding fathers envisioned. They were the pioneers and the explorers, the unafraid. Jefferson signed off on those Lewis and Clark expeditions that flew right here through Ohio as well. I want to think about what are the Lewis and Clark expeditions of our day? Leadership in the AI race, leadership in leading the world and not just relying on somebody else's semiconductors, but making them and actually utilizing them right here in the United States of America. A country that doesn't have to rely on our adversaries in China for our own military industrial base, but instead a country who demonstrates and shows the rest of the free world what's actually possible. When the shining city on a hill no longer shines, what hope does the rest of the world have. That's what we have to ask ourselves. So we're doing this not just for the United States. I've had world leaders in the last 24 hours reaching out. They are rooting for our success too, because this is not just important for the United States of America. It's important that we set an example for the rest of the world as well. And I think we will. And if we do, if we get this right in the next, not even the next four years, the next four months and setting up for January, 2025 alone is going to be a year that I think turns this country around. If we get this right, we don't have to be this nation in decline anymore that we've become. We don't have to be at the end of the ancient Roman Empire, as we're taught to believe. We can still be a nation in our ascent. A nation still on our way up, still on our way to that shining city on a hill. That country where we will look our kids in the eye and mean it when we tell them that you can achieve the maximum of your God-given potential without anybody standing in your way. And you know what? You're free to speak your mind at every step of that way. That is the America we know. 
That is the America we can work together to restore. And with your help and the help of patriots, whether you're on the left or the right across this country, that is the self-confidence that I hope we revive in the few months ahead of us as we await the new administration. So, when to get that tree. That is a wild looking tree, isn't it? Anyway, you know, I just wanted to point something out. It's so hard to get the truth. Now on X, it's being reported that the Israelis started that uh, riot at the game. And, uh, you know, then they provoked everything. And then they just reported on the radio that, no, it was the other side that provoked it and the Israelis were the poor victims. You know, which do you believe? Which do you believe? I, I hope I can find some videos on it and maybe we can make our own determination. But I'm telling you, yeah, that's that's the problem. It's, it's not misinformation, it's bad information or lies. There's so many lies that are told these days. You just don't know who or what to believe until you can almost have to see it with your own eyes. And this on the video, <laughs> I mean, it's getting kind of dark and doesn't this look like something out of a horror movie? Look at these trees right here. That is crazy. I mean, when it's, you know, during the daytime when it's all bright and lit up, it doesn't look so sinister. But man, right now, it looks awful sinister to me.